This is Megapine. Megapine. M I P. With Masamela Matsumo. Mark Thompson. Megapine. Get woke. Ladies and gentlemen, joining us once again for another edition of Thursday Coast, the founder of DailyCoast.com, the largest online progressive community, the host of The Brief, and the founding founder of the polling firm, Civics with a Q. Dot com. Marcos Melitzis. Hey, buddy. How are you? How are doing things? great. How are you doing? I'm okay. So are you, what are your thoughts about your senator, Diane Feinstein? <laughs> get right to it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're right there. Uh, I want to yeah, get into it. I, I don't, what's, what's going on? You know, I, I, I did not, I, not, I did not support her re-election bid um, for several reasons. And one of them being how out of touch she has become. Uh, but big part of it is her age. And there is a, there is a problematic refusal by so many major progressive, uh, democratic, liberal political figures to not step down when her time has come. And we saw how much RBG's refusal to step out of the seat, step down, retire when um, Obama was president, how that has led directly to the destruction of so many of the things she cared about. And now we're seeing it again with Dianne Feinstein, where the judicial committee is deadlocked. Nothing's going to happen. Mark, nothing will happen. In, we cannot pass a single judge for the rest of this term. That's where we are right now. Because, and, and people don't seem to realize this, the committee membership is set by the organizing resolution at the beginning of the, of the um, session. It cannot be changed without going through the filibuster right now. So as long as Republicans say, we're not going to seat somebody. So right now their excuse is, oh, you're just trying to marginalize Diane Feinstein. She's such a wonderful person. That's her claim. As soon as Diane Feinstein, if she were to retire uh, or, uh, or somehow is no longer in the seat, and the Democrats appoint somebody new, you know, Gavin Newsom appoints some new senator, and there is a Democratic senator that could slide into judiciary, the Republicans are not going to allow it. Why would they? I would tell our team not to let that happen <laughs> if, I was, if I was, you know, reverse. It's like, why give them a free shot at filling judge uh, judicial vacancies? Now, to be clear, this doesn't affect appellate or Supreme Court justices. It only affects um, district-level courts judges. But there is a massive shortage nationwide. The Republicans, Donald Trump, spent years packing those lower courts. Those are the feeder systems into the appellate courts. And uh, in fact, right now, if you talk about, you know, the importance of the lower courts, this, this, uh, this, um, this uh, decision by the judge in Texas to ban the uh, morning after pill, that's a trial court judge. These are the, just, these are the seats that are right now open. We cannot fill a single one of them. It won't be able to unless we do the nuclear option, get rid of the filibuster, and Manchin and Cinema have already said that they won't do that. So this is where we are because people like Diane Feinstein won't retire when her time has come. And it's, she's done so much. She's such a trailblazing figure. Why not retire? Go spend time with your family. And I'm not saying just this about Feinstein. There's a lot of Democrats. Right now, Congress is the oldest it has ever been. We have an entire new generation of leaders. We're seeing them in Tennessee, right? You, you've been hanging out with those guys, you know, supporting them. We have an entire new generation of Democratic, liberal, progressive leaders, and yet they are kept out because so many of the Democratic Party uh, elected officials in Washington, D.C. won't retire when their time has up. It's retirement time, folks. Time to move aside. Time to let new blood in. So it's really frustrating, particularly in California, which is not... Okay, Joe Manchin... It's West Virginia. There's not a single other Democrat that can win in West Virginia. California is the deepest Democratic bench in the country is in California. There's a lot of great possibilities. Feinstein could retire. Her legacy is safe. So I just want to be sure about this because I don't think I, we've not heard that report in the way you just said. Um, we can't get district judges seated. Because confirmed, yeah, um, oh, yeah confirmed because she is in that seat and she's not able to function. To be there. Yeah. It, right now it's a 50-50 because uh, the Democrats, cause, you know, they have the very slight majority. It's a one seat majority in that, in that committee. And right now we don't have that. And, an and, seat. and, 
even if she were to step down today and someone would be appointed in her place, it's still a no, no go because Republicans could prevent that person from being seated on the committee. Yep, they can filibuster the organizing resolution, which is what determines who sits in what seat. Now, you got some pretty naive reporters in D.C. saying, well, tradition says. We all know how important tradition is to Republicans, right? Yeah, right. And now and I'm telling you, like, no, if I was in is, their place, right. if I was in their place, I'd say the heck was tradition. I'd be blocking, you know, if it was Trump, I'd be blocking those, those judges. So I don't blame Republicans for doing this. I blame uh a system that allows the filibuster to block this kind of decision. The majority should have a say. And that's on cinema, that's on Manchin, and every Democrat that has allowed this travesty of a filibuster to continue. No, tradition is important to them. It's just they're going back to the tradition of the 1800s. Um, yeah. That's the one that they're practicing. So, man, wait a minute. This is heavy. You mean to tell me? Because I've not heard it put that way before, folks. I want people to understand what Marcos is saying. Unless she comes back to full function of health, we can't get judges, which is one of district the, judges. District judges, yeah. which is one of the when that's important though, because that's one of the hallmarks of the Biden administration. That's one thing he's been able to point to. Yeah, the diversity of of judges he's been able to appoint, and there is a shortage. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, wait a minute. I have a question though. Why? But you're right. I guess it's, I guess it's, I, I'm thinking of the question. I'm answering my own question. Everybody there, and it's not to knock people who were in the '80s and '90s and whatnot, folks. But at what point do people not consider? Well, you know, if I'm hanging around here, and something like this happens to me, you don't have to be 80 to get sick yeah. or to get shingles like she. Had. So I'm wondering, why don't people think about these things? I mean, if you're Joe Biden, there's a vice president. There's a system in place that, that will, will allow for continuity. If you're a Democratic senator, state senator in California, they have a, they have a super majority. Who cares, right? Like, okay, we, we lose a seat. It don't matter. It makes zero difference in the calculation of power in California. But when you're sitting on one seat majorities in something as important as judiciary, I mean, if you want to stick around, okay. Nobody can make her not stick around. Her constituents, you know, decided to reelect her. Don't sit on an important committee like judiciary where your absence can literally create the conditions where we have judges that it can single a judge in Texas can ban the abortion pill nationwide. Now, that was stated by the appeals court and the Supreme Court in part, but still, it's, it's already there are restrictions on the abortion pill that weren't before that ruling. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's pretty scary. Judges matter, and I have to say, uh, Mark, I don't know if we've talked since since Wisconsin, but it's finally liberals are realizing, Democrats are realizing the importance of judicial re uh, of races. Right? They they Trump, I think, has made it very very clear, and we're finally fighting Republicans on the judicial front, and so it's really incredibly frustrating when when something like this. And, and Mark, um, uh, Senator Feinstein has not been well for a while. I mean, it's, right. it's not even an open secret. It's, it's open knowledge. She's not there. She's, she's introducing herself as Mayor Feinstein. Like she's, she's not, she's clearly not there anymore. There, there is, there is, um, some loss of mental faculties. And so the fact that they, that nobody has interceded and said it's time. She's no longer well. Uh, when staff have to try to explain to her, and she's completely lost, trying to explain to her what's going on or what a question really is asking, is, uh, is, um, abs it, it's just embarrassing. And it really infuriates me that people around her haven't, haven't interceded and said it's time. It's, you know, I have an intervention. Where's her but family? Now, where's that's her, family? her What's that? Does she have family? Where's her family? I don't know. Maybe she's outlived them all. <laughs> she's old. <laughs> that ain't his hard stuff. Oh my god, I'm gonna get in trouble. Yeah, but um it's she's there there's a time and a place and, and really she's no longer fit for office. And it's one thing when it just affects her and maybe her constituents and you know, California suffers the consequences of a of an absentee senator. It's another when the entire country now suffers the consequences, which is what's happening. Wow.
um, unbelievable. Um, Marcos, um, we, well, as you mentioned, I'm, being in Tennessee, they try to make it about other issues, but it clearly is about gun violence. In fact, I'm, I'm still, I've been back and forth. I'm back in Tennessee. Um, and we continue to see more gun violence. A young man in Kansas City, there was another young woman shot who also knocked on the wrong door. Uh, Alabama, Louisville. Did you see the cheerleaders? The cheerleaders, the, yeah, right. That that uh, accidentally tried to get in the wrong car. Yeah, right, right. That too, that too, right, right. Was right. horrified, went back into her, you know, her friend's car, and this guy went after them and shot them. Yeah, yeah. But is, I mean, this is probably an unfair question for you. It's more of a meaning of life question, but I, I have to ask it, maybe because all the things you know that I don't know. What can we do? Now, in, let me say this. In Nashville, those of you who have been watching and following this, um, there, is, there is a diversity of people here. Um, women, white women especially, again, suburban college educated. A lot of college students here in Nashville still protesting. Um, but there's a super majority in this state, like a lot of states, what can we, I mean, it's, it's, it just seems, and someone asked me to, uh, today, you know, I, there's, there's nothing we can do. They said, what can we do? The votes I'll, I'll aren't, you, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what we can do. Um, we have a Supreme Court that pretends are about original intent on everything, right? Original right. intent, original intent, but are going to somehow pretend that the words well-regulated militia don't, aren't the frame around which the Second Amendment was built upon. And so we literally, there's not much we can do right now, this second, but we can do what the, what the anti-abortion movement did for 50 years, is they worked and they built and they organized and they finally got the Supreme Court they needed. And that's what we need to do. I mean, we have to realize that this is a long-term fight. Uh, it is unfortunate that there are no levers of power that we can wield right now that can, that can uh, overcome this reactionary Supreme Court. But we can build towards that. And that means we need to hold the ground in the Senate. We need to get rid of the filibuster. We need to build when, when the, you know, on the map. And public opinion is, is, is important, Mark. And I will say that the abortion issue has dramatically reshaped the suburban political landscape. Particularly, we always talk about it, white, college-educated, suburban, white women. We're seeing evidence that men are starting to to shift. These issues will continue that trend. And uh, I, I've been, I've been, I've, <laughs> I have a new hobby, Mark. Watch People Magazine. People Magazine is the most, it's, it's the largest non-free publication in the country. It's circulation of 80 million, I believe. And it's full of stories on women having issues uh, under abortion restrictions and tons of stories on gun violence. This stuff is seeping into the mainstream in a way that it had not before. Before it was a political debate. Now it's actually percolating around parts of the media landscape that are really non-political and it's just regular heartland, middle of the country Americans are, are watching and reading. And so there is an opportunity here to expand our coalition using these issues. It's is absolutely abhorrent that we have lost Roe v. Wade protections, but it has presented a political opportunity and Democrats have walked right into it. We're the party to protect those rights. And we can be the party to protect youth, you know, young people from, uh, from gun violence and let Republicans just burrow themselves into that 30% minority that they are in. And uh, my good friend, Simon Rosenberg, I believe you might know Simon. Uh, he, uh, he's a longtime Politico, you know, he's worked in the party committees and now he's, he's solo and he has, a he has a, uh, sub stack and, um, he was one of the very few people in the sort of the party establishment that said that Democrats were going to win last year. And he was accused of being, you know, hopium and the press laughed at him and everybody thought he was so silly, but it was like him, Joe Trippy, which was Howard Dean's campaign manager back in the day, uh, and me and us at Daily Coast, we were like we were like the only people saying like we're not going to lose this election, guys. Uh, you know, this is looking like a typical midterm election. Well, 
Simon has he he's now talking. This is Mark. This this seems so freaking obvious, and yet it's so revolutionary. I can't even believe it. He's saying Democrats have gotten really good at winning fifty one percent of the vote, and if you look at the last you know thirty years of presidential elections, we're like fifty one Republicans, forty six, fifty one, forty six, almost across the board, and they've only won won the popular vote once in those last thirty years. That was after nine eleven. Uh, and uh, so what's stopping us from going to 55% of the vote? Like, why why are we so content fighting for that 51%, which means that Hillary's emails at the last minute, you know, you just ship one or two points in the Republican direction and you lose the election. 51%. Now you get to 55% and we have what we had in the Wisconsin Judicial Supreme Court race, right? Where we won 56-44. Once you're up there, you're winning by 10 points. Who cares if like there's last minute news or there's a storm or any kind of blip, right? Okay, so you win by eight instead of by 12, right? Who cares? That's what we need to do. And we're only going 51 to 55%, right? That's four points. It's doable. The space is there. And it's there because of abortion. It's there because Donald Trump and his, his assault on, on democracy and guns. That's the tripod. It literally is a tripod that's going to get us to 55%. Once we're at 55%, Mark, the whole political landscape changes. It means Wisconsin is no longer a battleground at that point. Pennsylvania is no longer a battleground. You know what it is? Mississippi and Texas, those states, North Carolina starts becoming you know, more closely contested. We have a landscape where we can expand that Senate playing field. We can, we can be more secure in the presidential race. We can nail down the House. Because that suburban battleground, all those suburban districts that are Republican right now that were drawn to be Republican, they're all, they're all changing. And then you have a landscape where as these re- conservative Supreme Court justices die or, or retire, that they can be replaced with justices. That will actually listen to what the, first, the Second Amendment said, which was a well-regulated militia. Well-regulated, well-regulated. Not to mention militia. Let's just talk about well-regulated. And we're going to pretend that the Second Amendment says that there can be no restrictions on, on guns. It just blows my mind. Yeah, um, and, and I think you're right. That is what is going to continue to mobilize people um, and hopefully prevent our side from becoming apathetic. It, and, and the Supreme Court is in the process of re- reviewing the pill, the um, methoprestone, I believe is how you pronounce it. And I mean, they, they still don't get it. So they make a decision adverse to women on that. That'll just make it even more wreck. That'll just yeah, bring about after, even more. After they said that, oh, no, we just care about sending it back to the states. Now, let's see if that's true, because that'd be a national ban. And, you know, let's, let's see how real, how... Um, and I actually... From a practical standpoint, I could see the Supreme Court actually ruling against that, even on maybe like jurisdiction grounds, like finding some excuse not to, because they know <laughs> they're, all, they're Republicans, right? They want Republicans to win, and they just saw their party wiped out, and their future prospects are absolutely looking dire. So if I'm a Republican Supreme Court justice, I'm thinking like, okay, how do I cool the temperature down um, and, and, you know, and, and affirming a ban on the morning after drug would just be an absolute. I mean, that's, that's it. Like Tennessee, it's only in play. Like, I mean, they would dramatically shift things um, in a way that, that I don't think they want to see happen, but it, it, it sucks to say like we may, it may take 50 years. I don't think it's going to take 50 years, Mark. I think the timeline is accelerated as long as we remain engaged and active, but we can take lessons from the anti-abortion movement and how, patient and persistent they were in their fight in order to uh, sort of emulate that and realize, okay, this is, this is not going to be easy. There's no quick solution. And because um, uh, six people on the Supreme Court are going to invalidate the obvious wishes of the vast majority of the American people. And so what are we going to do about it? And it could be accelerated even quicker. I mean, what if we get, what if we surprise everybody and pick up a couple of seats in the Senate next year. It would be, the map is horrible. The map is so bad. I don't see it happen. But what happens if there's, a, there's an earthquake, political earthquake, and we can take a couple of seats, we can get rid of the filibuster, and then we expand the court. 
I mean, we don't have to wait for those justices to die off. We can literally expand the court to 15 overnight. There are solutions that can happen, but we need to organize and we need, we need to fight for them. And we need to figure out ways to win in places like Texas uh, and Florida even, because those are unfortunately our best pickup opportunities next year in the Senate. Uh, but if this is as impactful and is, is um, and these Republican actions are as unpopular as they seem to be, can Democrats take advantage of that climate, push to 55%, make states like Texas and Florida competitive again, and then it's a different world. So that's what needs to happen. And I'm actually excited for that fight, Mark. I'm, 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 people want that fight. Right. And it's, it's fun. Not like, Mark, like 10 years ago, like during the Obama years when nobody wanted to do anything. Remember that? That was, that was brutal. This is a different world. And people were still dying back then. We still had gun violence. We had all those things happening. And people just weren't activating. Things are different now. I, I can sense it. Um, no, that's, that's Im important to note. Um, and we like to think that, you know, that's real, that people are moving forward. People want to want to be in this fight and are going to sustain. And we know that the gun violence is not going to go away. There's probably some a mass shooting taking place, even during the midst of this conversation we're having now. What is what is civics um, saying? What trends have you been looking at in terms of civics and gun control? So it's, we have a gun control trend line uh, on the civics homepage. Anybody can go see it, civics with a Q. And the pattern that we've seen is that there's big support for, for gun control after a major mass shooting. And then it, it, and then it fades. Like it, you know, so you got these, and then there's the next gun shooting, right? And so it's like this electrocardiogram, right? It's up and down, up and down, uh, depending on the, on the shooting. What does happen, though, is that the, the bottom line is a little higher every time, just a little bit higher. So it just gradually goes up over time. And, uh, and like I haven't checked to see like this last week because it's just we've been hit with boom, 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 right? With, with, um, with massacres and not even massacres. These, these shootings, you know, the Kansas City one, the, the, the cheerleading, like this isn't even a mass shooting. This is just people randomly trying to kill other people for no other reason than they happen to take a wrong turn or knock on a wrong window. And um, I mean, I can't even imagine how you feel threatened by cheerleaders, like <laughs> accidentally trying to walk in your car. Like clearly they're not they're trying to carjack you. No, they left. So, um, so again, I haven't, I haven't checked right now to see what those numbers are, but they, they're definitely, we're seeing the uptick from, a, from the recent spate of gun violence. and. The problem is, and this is what Republicans have learned, is that that fading afterwards, right? They know they can just write it out. So they can do their, their hopes and prayers and, oh, we, we should do more about mental illness, they'll say. They have no interest in doing anything about mental illness or gun violence. They don't care. They know that the American public will eventually uh, lull themselves back into complacency. And that's, that's the complacency part is the part that we can't allow to happen. And, and in its in a vacuum, it's easier for that complacency to happen. I think right now with the assault on democracy, the assault on, on, on abortion, that the gun rights as a third prong actually has more staying power. It, it actually builds on the others to create that narrative that our very existence is at risk. They want to see our children dead. They want to control our bodies and they want to take away our democracy. It is a powerful anti-Republican narrative that they feed into by, by explicitly being fascist in rhetoric and in, in, in outlook and in policy. So it is, again, it, that's the opportunity that we have as a party and as a movement to step into that breach that they're giving us. They're gifting us space to push that base of democratic support nationally from 51 to 55%. And does that four points, it dramatically changes everything. We don't have to get to 60, 55. Right. Uh, 50, 45 at the moment on at civics.com. And when you look into the demographics, I, I thought I might see a, some better numbers for Republican women uh, when it comes to gun control, but no, uh, <laughs> they're, they're pretty solidly, which is really unbelievable. 
I mean, that that even Republican women, I, I wonder. And, you know, that's one of those things you have to wonder whether that's real or whether they're just saying that. Um, the other thing to note, though, is that that a lot of old Republican women have left. So a lot of what used to be a Republican woman, which was these white suburban college educated um, white women in the suburbs, like suddenly saying, like, you know what, I'm an independent now <laughs> or, you know, becoming Democrats. So what you're seeing with the Republican Party, it's it's actually shrinking. It's it's um, civics won't show that, but Pew data and voter registration data will show that voter registration, the size of the Republican Party is shrinking and uh, it's becoming more MAGA as it shrinks. Right. It's it's shedding anybody that has any hint of moderation. And that's crazy. Lastly, uh, Ron DeSantis. So Chris Christie has spoken out against him in the past few days what what is and he's still taking on disney it's so who weird dis, who dislikes disney <laughs> i mean you can dislike disney the company because they're they're you know what they do with copyright law and i mean they're 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 a corporate behemoth right and they're, they're they have plenty of horrible things to to rail against he's railing for the wrong reasons <laughs> he's not railing for working conditions or or subverting of copyright law or any of the, you know, any, or, uh, uh, you know, things like that. I mean, he, he's, he's going after them because they have gay night at Disneyland for speaking out against, against, uh, don't say gay law. It's, you know, DeSantis, it's just sort of a, he may be the most hilariously bad politician we've seen in a long time. I mean, it's a wonder that he won reelection by as much as he did. Um, because he does not, um, I mean, I always thought he was going to fail as a politician. If you ever seen him, he wears high heels, right? He doesn't have, he, he, he literally wears high heels and it's boots. No, they're high heels. It's like two inch heels because he's a small guy. He has no presence. He doesn't walk in a room and he fills it. You know, politicians who fill the room uh, or activists uh, who fill the room. And he does not do that. His voice is thin and um, lacks any hint of masculinity. And these are things that we can we wish wouldn't matter, but they actually matter for, pol for political campaigns and particularly for Republicans who try to be all macho, you know, masculinity, blah, blah, blah. So I always thought he was going to flame out the more people saw him. I didn't realize he was going to flame out before people saw him. I mean, this is a hilarious part of it. And, and so he, I don't, I don't know what he was thinking, but he decided to run this. He was going to spend a lot of early money building organization and, in all these key states, he wasn't going to put all his all his marbles into Iowa, New Hampshire. Uh, so he needs all this money, and his his donors are abandoning him because of his social extremism. This six week ban that he just signed in the dead of night in Florida, he doesn't realize that uh, that um, that the American public, or maybe he does and doesn't care, but you know, on abortion, on democracy, and all these issues. Donald Trump's on the wrong side of public opinion, and there's a real opportunity for him to set himself apart. But he he mildly criticized Trump over Stormy Daniels, and he said something like, "I don't, I don't know, you know." Uh, it wasn't even like a direct attack on him. It was some. It was I can't remember, but it was something very weak. Like, I I'm not going to comment because I don't know what kind of information they may have about you know this uh, this adult film star. It was something weak like that. Donald Trump went after him hard and he backtracked immediately. And Mark, hasn't Donald Trump taught anybody that apologizing in politics is a sign of weakness? You never apologize, and particularly if you're a Republican. So Ron DeSantis basically not only did he not even, you know, it's one of those like if you're gonna if you're gonna take a shot at the queen, best not to miss. He took a shot, missed by a mile, and then he he backtracked and looked weak in the process. And that's not what Republicans are going for. And his numbers are absolutely tanking after that. Doesn't help that po politics wise, his policies are, are unpopular, but it is just amazing how poor his political instincts are, how unprepared he's been for Trump attacking him. Trump's attacked him on Social Security for cutting Social Security and, and Medicaid and Medicare. And, and uh, like these ads look like they're by Democrats. It's absolutely freaking hilarious. And, and so, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's flailing. And um, politics has a funny way of resuscitating seemingly dead politicians. So I, I wouldn't sit there and say, like, he's done. 
but right now he, he looks pretty done. Two inch heels. Yeah, he's got two inch heels. Yeah, no, and they're they're cowboy boots. Like, yeah, okay, they're cowboy boots, sure, but they have heels in Florida. <laughs> and people Florida. are cow, cowboy boots really yeah. on a thing in Florida, in Texas, his, Wyoming. His, yeah, his six week ban has to support about thirty percent of Floridians. I mean, he's not he's not yeah. even remotely trying to govern from a place of of trying to be popular and and it just amazes me like okay he beats donald trump somehow then what i mean his 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 ratings are in the gutter i mean he's worked at least donald trump has a loyal set of people that will vote for him come hell or high water right and they don't care if donald trump sleeps with porn stars or you know runs ads criticizing desantis for cutting social security which is like a thing that all republicans supposedly like they don't care DeSantis doesn't have that. So you walk into a presidential general election with that set of policies that, that uh, and, and an angry Donald Trump at that, right? Because you know, Donald Trump wouldn't go away. Um, I, don't, I don't know what his plan, like what he thinks he would do at that point. Yeah, right. Because that's not, that's not anything for the general electorate. And he's so far gone, it's not like he can pivot back to the middle. No. He's gone. No. He's completely gone. Yeah. You don't go from six weeks and then pivot. Six week ban on abortion and shipping, shipping immigrants to to Joe Biden's house in you know Delaware and then pivot to something moderate. No, no way. Yeah, nut job, total nut job. Civics with a Q. dot com, dailycoast. dot com. Always subscribe to podcast the brief weekly. Thanks again, buddy. Thanks so much. And uh, enjoy Tennessee. Uh, feels exciting, right? The energy is so exciting. You know, and it was, it was a small victory the other night because we filled up the gallery. That was awesome. E- expecting the vote on arming teachers. And they saw all of us. And then the Senate announced they're not even going to take it up. So they tabled it. It may come back up before session closes today or tomorrow. But um, but there's fight. There's fight, and it's a state where we didn't right. see fight for right. a long time, and that's what make, gives me hope for the future. So, and, and what people don't remember, so I grew up here, and when I was growing up here, I was actually a page in the house. My uncle was chief sergeant at arms. Tennessee was a blue state. Yeah, had a republic. I mean, had a democratic governor, Al Gore, and there were two democratic senators from Tennessee, Al Gore and Jim Sasser. And back to your point about the strategy. It was really the Clintons that first abandoned the 50 state thing. It was like they cut a deal. We'll let you and New Gingrich have the house and we'll just focus on holding the executive mansion. Uh, and like you said, even Obama administration, like they were u- operating out of the same playbook. Oh, no, you know, we're not going to win the house. I mean, Biden comes along and says, no, we're going to do something. And I mean, Democrats didn't win, but they won the house. Republicans didn't win it. If anything, n- nobody won it or if anything, they, you know, shot themselves. So, I mean, I think you're right. There are opportunities um, to build on this, even in a state like Tennessee. And, and Nashville, mm-hmm. a big city now, is very liberal. Memphis, and other places like that. Uh, but it's, it's not like it, it, it hasn't been blue before. Yeah, um, and it's it, going to be a lot of work, but it's, it's, it's doable. Right, and more people are moving here. Because, mm-hmm. you know, if I wanted to move back home for a lower cost of living, eh, that ain't happening. It's cost so much living Nashville than living in New York. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> but, but there's, there's, I mean, there, there are people moving here. So, you know, we'll see what happens. The, the fight is yep. on. Folks, we got to keep fighting. Yep, stay I'm in glad touch. you're there. Yeah, and so look, stay in touch, too, uh, with DailyCoast.com. Be on top of all of the progressive issues, which, which, which are the issues that the majority of Americans support. I don't care what anybody says. Oh, and I know what I want to mention. Before we go, you mentioned people. Man, speaking of being a teenager here in Nashville, I haven't looked at people since before there was the internet. Because wait a minute, people used to always be in the line in the grocery store. Yes. And, when, you know, we go through the grocery store and there was always some big headline on there. People was, was, was a few steps above the tabloids, but they still had, sometimes they have salacious headlines. Yeah. I just went on the website, you're right. And we know everybody... Looks at people. They're talking 80 about million. Yeah. 80 million 
the magazine, not even the, the online, even more probably. 80 yes. million, this magazine has 80 million circulation. And it's all about abortion and all about abortion restrictions and, and women dying from not being able to have abortions and uh, family planning issues. And, uh, and now the gun stuff. Wow. Yeah. I found out about the cheerleader from a, somebody sending me a People magazine article. Well, I learned something. You. Maybe I need to start looking at people more too, and and seeing what they're doing, and we can see culture's how culture's moving. Yeah. yeah, the culture's moving. Marcos Melissa again, dailycoast.com, dot with a Q dot com. The podcast, the brief. Thank you, buddy. Yep. Catch you next week. Thanks for getting woke and listening to Make It Plain. As always, perform an act of kindness on behalf of an elder or young person. Write a letter to a sister or brother who just so happens to find her or himself incarcerated. Offer libations to the ancestors upon whose sturdy shoulders we all now stand. And above all, give thanks to the God of your understanding by whatever name you call her and him. All God asks of us is that we give each other love. Thanks for giving MIP love. And please remember to subscribe and give us a five-star rating. If all hearts and minds are clear, it has been made plain.